for all of us who started in the you know early 60s making movies was the, was the reaction to the stupidity and superficiality of the so so-called uh, social realism movies so uh, you know like in my in my first films i didn't care about the story it's all just to see a real faces real people on the screen doing the human things was enough for me, I was fascinated. And I guess, you know, that this is uh, the result that, you know, to show life, life as it is around myself in, 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 in the, you know, society I'm living, uh, to see the real people doing the real things, living the real uh, emotions, you know, that was, uh, that was it, you know, just to capture that. Perfect, thank you. Rock and roll. That's it for today. We have a very good... Uh, I, I, I'm glad that I stepped a few times in front of the camera because unless you do it, you really, you really don't know how an actor feels. And that's uh, very good for, for the director to know that. To know that... Uh, because when I, when I started, you know, it seemed to me so simple to tell the actor, do this, this, this. Why he can't do that? It's so easy, it's so simple. Well, go in front of the camera and try yourself. Suddenly you realize it's not so simple, it's not so easy. Oh. That young lady is the daughter of Madame de Volange. Okay. And she's under my protection. She's 15, so you must be, you know? You know right. It sounds good. That sounds, sounds, sounds good. That's the definition of acting. And from Gandhi, and Melody Patinkin asked him, what is it that makes great acting great, James? And he said, well, just plant your feet on the ground, look the other actor directly in the eye, tell the truth. That's it. I like that. Valmont's not quite as mean or diabolical. Was that pretty much your interpretation, or was that Milos just encouraging that? Very much Milos. Um, he was right. It felt right. Um, I agreed with him. I suffered from a great temptation to make him as much of a villain as possible a lot of the time. I think actors want to do that. Um, I don't know, maybe some don't, I, I, but I love villains. I mean, I, 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 I would love to really play one full throttle and just seem as evil as possible. But I think in our particular interpretation, I think that would have been an oversimplistic and far too comfortable a choice. And I think that Paradoxically, despite the fact that the characters in our film are perhaps lighter and more likable as such, I think that it's, it is slightly more difficult because it's not as comfortable to like these people and their behavior. I think it would be far easier if you could sit back and judge them and shake your head and tut, you know, that, they, that they're all up to no good and I would never do such a thing. Uh, whereas in this one, I think you get involved, and I think that you. I don't think anybody should really do anything in this film that's very far beyond what anybody else is capable of. Does that mean? And I think that's part of its strength. You don't love me. He looked at a lot of actors, I'm told, before he decided that you would be found. Mm. So what did you do that impressed him so much? I really don't know. I mean, I've I've tried to work it out, obviously, and I. I um, I think I, I just took it a different approach. I mean, what, as you see, the, the, this, I'm really not what most people expect Valmont to be like, I don't think. And uh, I think it was precisely that that interested him. He didn't want anything obvious in this film. And there is nothing obvious in this film. Thank goodness, because we've all seen plays or read the book or seen another film version. And uh, I think this is full of surprises. And nobody is what you expect. And I think he, his problem with most of the people he saw was they, they made the art of seduction a terribly serious business. They smoldered and they looked dangerous and all this sort of thing. And I, I remember Milos saying, why is it, why do they think that a woman who goes to bed with a man who's so serious all the time, you know, why, you know, why, does, he not, why does he not make her laugh? And, uh, and I, I, I knew that I wasn't going to get away with a smoldering lover thing. I mean, that's just not me. And I, I, so I, I used levity and humor and uh, I suppose it must have had something to do with that. You know, the relationship with the director is very often... Uh, it's a, I find, for instance, when I'm on the horse, 
But if I find the horse gets uneasy with me, I start to get uneasy with the horse. The horse senses that I'm uneasy. The horse gets more uneasy. I get angry. Then I start to think, you know, these are the rules. When I kick you this way, why don't you just do it this way? It's simple. Go. And that's what I'm telling you to do. And the horse is sensing that it's not, I have perhaps not behaved in a controlled way because I'm uneasy. And this can be the same with the relationship with the director. You were quoted as having said that Milos Forman never lets you off the hook. What did you mean? There are directors, I think, particularly if you're working to a tight schedule and you've got little money, who will say, lovely darling, that's fine, that'll do, and it's in the can, and it really is second best. And uh, Milos will never allow that to happen. You know, you, he, you, he knows if it could be better, and he knows if you can do better. And he doesn't, or even if you feel you can't do better, and he thinks you can, or, you know, he'll, he'll go for it, and, tell you, and, and it doesn't matter how much sweat there is. Uh, as a result, he just keeps at it, and it's, it's quite a grueling thing, but it's, it's uplifting, because uh, uh, eventually, I think, actors will excel themselves under those circumstances. It's done in such good faith, there's never any real hostility, there's never any anger involved, there's never anything malicious. You know, you hear of directors who are really quite sadistic in their approach, and there's nothing of that with him. It's entirely humane. And um, you're, re you're always on the same side, you know? You're working f to make the thing good. And uh, it, was, it was enormously challenging and exhilarating to work like that. But yeah, there are times you get testy, and there were times that he got depressed. I remember, I remember he, he, there was an airplane going over for the 50th time, and, and uh, the sound man said, well, what do you want, Milos? Do you want me to wire them, or do you, uh, should we do weather cuts? Should we go indoor? And he just said, I don't want to make any more movies anymore. <laughs> you know, and it, it, there, I mean, there are times, and it gets to that point in six months of shooting, you know. I like working with him very much. He's, uh, he's really an inspiring person because he has great passion and great energy, great enthusiasm and joy. I think he really enjoys making films. He enjoys the day-to-day -day process of it. Hey, we're going to take a look at it, huh? That's very good. Yeah, that's not very good. It's beautiful to you. It's not very good. It's not very good. He knows what he wants very much and he gets, he notices everything you do and it has to be perfect. <laughs> Both Amadeus and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest made use of many character actors playing the smaller roles, which came to be a trademark for the director. Many of these actors got their start in Foreman's films, including Christopher Lloyd, Vincent Schiavelli, and Danny DeVito. I think uh, that the small uh, you know, parts, you know, bit parts, are as important as the main uh, characters. In a certain way, I am paying even more attention to uh, casting the small bit parts, because they have to be, you know, once you see them, you will never forget them. Again, you have a collection of extremely talented actors, many of whom were just starting, like Brad Dourif, Vincent Schiavelli again, Danny DeVito, and Christopher Lloyd, Christopher Lloyd in his first film. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we, when, when we look at your films, you, you see this time and again, uh, Howard Rollins and Elizabeth McGovern in Ragtime, for example, Courtney Love in The People vs. Larry Flint. You've given a lot of people their first shot or their first shot at doing something other than what they're known for doing. Um, is, that, is that something you enjoy doing, discovering new talent, and how have you been so good at doing it, uh, finding these people? Well, first of all, it's always, uh, it was always, for me, always exciting to cast somebody whom I'm not too, uh, too much used to, you know. Well, when, you know, for example, you know, first screen appearances in their lives on Taking Off. Yeah. Carly Simon, Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates, and Tina Turner. Yeah. So no, it's uh, it's for me exciting to uh, you know be myself surprised, and it's a little bit you know also kind of a pride in it, you know, to surprise the audience with some you know new faces and new new people. Milos, he knows it inside and out. He's got the film made in his head to some degree. You can see it when he's working. Uh, when he's concentrating on something, it doesn't matter who's around him. It would be useless to try and interrupt him or to come up and ask him a question until it's obvious that he's worked through whatever the problem is in his head. It's as if he's watching the film. But the thing that he does working with actors, which 
I find really extraordinary is he puts himself at the center of the conflict of the scene. He puts himself at the center of the scene. So that on this picture, he has been very gentle, very elegant, very, that was wonderful, let's do it again. That was charming, yes? Whereas on a picture like Cuckoo's Nest, he'd come running in and say, You're crazy! What are you doing? What are you looking at? Ah! Run out and come back and say, Beautiful, beautiful. So he really put everybody off center, put everyone ill at ease. And he became the big nurse in the hospital. And, and you can always meet his eye in a scene, and he's right there. He's right there with you. He's exactly where you should be. And that's the part about working with him that's very interesting. This kind of crossover reality. When you are working on the crowd scenes, you didn't have time to, you know, rehearse perfectly every moment and every motion of everybody. So, uh, very often what you did, that you just provoked some kind of a general anarchy, you know, and in that anarchy, you know, the camera has to wander around and it all gives such an authenticity to the scenes and life. And it's uh, because we just didn't have a time to rehearse enough. What we like to do also is that uh, to use uh, two cameras and to tell people that, uh, okay, that this one camera will follow, of course, uh, the main protagonist, you know, who is center of the scene. But the other camera, I told everybody, will be wandering around and you will never know who is on. So please stay in the character all the time, all the time. And that's wonderful because it's helping, first of all, it's helping the main protagonist because he doesn't feel that every, the whole concentration is only on him or on her. So uh, he didn't feel that pressure, right? Plus, on the other hand, uh, the fact that everybody else was in the character, even if they were just extras, you know, uh, that they were not sort of laying back, I'm not on the, on the camera, so I'll just, you know, stay here and watch the actor. Uh, you know, that helped the whole relax everybody, uh, mainly relax the main actor. You know, when you gain their trust, it's wonderful. You don't have, for example, I didn't give them, the, they didn't know the script. Be, before every scene I said, well, listen, you know, now you will come and you say something like this and this and this, and, and you answer something like this. I knew the script by heart. And I was quoting exactly lines from the script I wanted them to say. Uh, but I said, well, you use something like this and this and this, and you say something like this and this and this. And, uh, and we'll see, and you know, if you forget, so you'd say it with your own uh, words. Okay, let's shoot it. Action. And that was wonderful. Because they were following your thoughts. They couldn't remember exact wording, so they had to express it in their own personal way. And that gives such a freshness and authenticity to everything. And sometimes they add things to it, you know, which you even didn't dream about because uh, improvisation sometimes, well, you know, it's true. 90% of real improvisation is very boring. <laughs> but that few persons, which they're priceless. So that's, uh, you know, the way we did this movie. Now, because this was really the first time you were working with a movie star in the form of Jack Nicholson, did you modify your approach because you were making ostensibly a bigger film with more professional talent? Partly. Not really. Just partly. For example, I used the improvisation a little bit. Whoever saw the film, the, the first meeting between the superintendent of the hospital and Jack Nicholson. When, so all I did was I... Uh, uh, the, there was a real superintendent of the hospital. It's not an actor, Dr. Brooks, mm. Dr. Dean Brooks. Oh, I, I gave him, listen, this is the history of this patient. Just do your job. So, and Jack Nicholson came in and the doctor did his job on him. And Jack was brilliant in improvising with him. You know, they knew, I told them, you know, the points they have to touch, but the rest is improvised. But no, no, the, the rest is very well structured and, you know, I. Uh, 
uh, you know, was from that first film where I didn't care about story at all, more and more after each film, you know, I was more sort of uh, focused on really have a good structure, and good storytelling. The difference between a professional actor and non-professional actor, uh, non-professional actor is not at all camera shy. He's audience shy. He doesn't like being watched by people, but camera is an object. He doesn't mind to give himself, uh, you know, strip him, his soul naked in front of that object. He minds to do it in front of live people. Professional actor is the other way around. They love the audience. They are playing to the audiences. The camera is intimidating. The camera doesn't laugh. Camera doesn't express uh, enthusiasm for them. They, you know, they don't like it very much. So it was very interesting. And mixing professional and non-professional actors helped both. You know. This affected his style greatly. Because there were often many characters in one scene, it was essential for the scenes to be built upon reaction shots. We can see a similar approach in his later films as well. Milos Forman is responsible for some of cinema's most iconic films, and his unique perspective helped bring the influence of the Czech New Wave to a new generation of filmmakers. Milos Forman's respect for material and for subject matter and for the quality of thought behind the writing uh, is totally international and, and far transcends. It, it, it is really not, an, I don't think it's an accident that Milos Forman has made a picture in Hollywood. You can't direct anything artificial, anything which doesn't sound and look real and true to him. It's impossible. And he's not, uh, doesn't feel any compulsion to give in to any outside source. He, he is for the picture 100% the truth, the truth that he's seeking in that picture. And, and these characters who dominate the, the films of your American period, shall we say, Salieri and Amadeus, Larry Flint and Larry Flint, Andy Kaufman and Man on the Moon, they're, they're, they're all, you know, sort of significant historical characters who are, who are outsiders, avant-garde figures, people on the sidelines of someone else's story. Um, I mean, you, it seems to me that your temperament would be to make a film about John Wilkes Booth rather than Abraham Lincoln, that you're attracted to these kind of characters, the, 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 the B story or the outsider's story. And I'm wondering how much of that, you know, is just influenced by your own experience being an immigrant, being um, an outsider in a way to your own story. Well, I guess it is influenced, uh, you know, by the... Because, you know, don't forget, I, li <laughs> I lived under so many different social, you know, systems, you know, the Nazis, uh, the communists, you know, democracy and like that. And... Uh, whatever this is now. Whatever it is now, right. <laughs> and you, you know... And you, uh, you know, especially when you live on the Nazis and the Communists, you realize that, uh, you know, the biggest uh, conflict an individual has is not with other individuals, but with institutions. And that uh, somehow, you know, makes me very compassionate to individuals who fight institutions. You know. This case he brought to the Supreme Court resulted in a very, very important decision about the freedom of expression. And I'm telling you, you know, I know from my life experience, freedom of the press is the cornerstone of democracy. It's not elections. They can be manipulated if you don't have a free press. It's not a free market. Hitler had a free market. It's the freedom of the press. And if you open the door to the censorship, a crack, it will never stay open, the crack. When you let the gene of uh, censorship out of the bottle, you'll never put him back. And it will have a devastating effect on the quality of life. Not only that life becomes very boring, but life becomes very cruel. Because under the censorship, anybody finally who didn't agree with the official ideology and the official taste and official regulations is enemy of state and will be silenced. And if you can't, 
if people who are doing atrocious things because they have power, if they are not afraid that tomorrow they, they will read about the, about it in the newspapers or on television, you are only encouraging this cruelty. Um, oh, it was Falwell. not about pornography at all, yeah. that case. About Falwell and a parody. It was saying, about the freedom to uh, satirize and mock public, public figures, figures in, like Larry, in the press. Yeah. Like Jerry Falwell. Yes. All right. They always go uh, on targets. Uh, they know people will applaud them. Okay. You know? And who would not applaud if I promise you to clean the streets from the smut? Of course, everybody applauded. And it but then, you know, suddenly, during the Nazis, not only uh, pornographers and prostitutes and homosexuals and lesbians were perverts, suddenly Jews, blacks, gypsies, for the communi communists, Christians, Muslims, the whole Western culture was perverse. I couldn't buy uh, Hemingway or Faulkner or, or Shakespeare. I couldn't buy for 20 years. But the main thing is that people should realize that we are taking our freedoms too much for granted. We think that that's the only commodity for which we don't have to pay anything. And that's very dangerous. Freedom is not cheap. You can say that Cuckoo's Nest is a movie about mental illness set in the Pacific Northwest on the one hand, or you can say that it's a movie about a group of people living under an oppressive social system who are rebelling against that, which makes it sound a lot like the movies that you had made prior to that. Uh, was that something that you, know, you were conscious of at all when you were reading the material, that there was you know, a way in which the dynamic between the hospital staff and the patients was not unlike the people who were living under Marxism in Black Pier and Loves of a Blonde and Fireman's Ball. You know, it's funny because when I was, uh, when I got this offer to make Ugusnes, a friend of mine, an American friend of mine told me, don't touch it, don't touch it, because, you know, that's very dangerous because it's, you know, it's such Americana and you can't really do it right and uh, if you flop with your first really film, you know, that, that will be the end of the... I, I said, what are you talking, Americana? <laughs> for, for you, it's a book, it's a literature, it's a fiction. But for me, it was reality. I lived it. Communist Party was my big nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Telling me what to say, what not to say, what, how to behave, what to think, you know. So it's... it's, it's, it's uh, what's, what's the difference? So, and that's the same thing, you know, because, uh, you know, yes, people can have different... Uh, Taste, different colors, different, uh, but the nature, human nature is the same everywhere.